Well, hello everyone and good evening. Uh, welcome to, or whatever time you're watching it at, if you're watching it with us live, good evening. Uh, this is AI Labs Not So Technical Workshop brought to you by UCLA ACM AI. And today we'll be looking at uh, some applications of artificial intelligence or AI for short, um, in a kind of beginner friendly way. Oh, my audio is not clear. Oh, uh, is anyone else, like, is, is it garbled for anyone else? Okay. Okay, uh, oh no. <sighs> it's getting better, okay. I will try to speak up and speak loudly enough from my laptop microphone to fully capture my voice. <laughs> and I apologize if there are any audio issues. Um, but yeah, it seems like for some people it's having some issues, for other people it's okay. So I'll just try to speak loudly and make sure that there's no issues there. So yeah, let's get started then. We're first going to talk about what is artificial intelligence and what is machine learning. Uh, and we have two definitions for you all. The first definition we're going to look at is for artificial intelligence or AI. And this is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, decision making, and translation between languages. And we want to highlight the phrase normally requires human intelligence because uh, as AI uh, tools develop and they become more sophisticated and more computers are able to do them, uh, we actually kind of stop thinking of things as AI uh, because it just becomes normal. But this is still a really useful definition because a lot of the things that uh, we consider to require human intelligence, like the three examples listed there, those are examples of what we currently consider artificial intelligence. And the second definition that we would look at is machine learning or ML. And even though machine learning and artificial intelligence often get used interchangeably in like mainstream media, they're actually two different things where machine learning is a subset or a type of artificial intelligence that provides computers with the ability to learn about being explicitly programmed. And what that means is we're still programming the computers, like we're still writing code, but we're not exactly giving, like programming every possible instruction to the computer. We want it to learn some things more or less on its own, if you want to think about it like that. And a helpful diagram is this kind of, uh, I don't know, bubble plot, I guess you could call it showing that artificial intelligence is this larger uh, domain and machine learning is a subset of that. So some things that might fall into artificial intelligence uh, are if else statements, decision trees and data mining. Uh, this is not a comprehensive overview, overview. There are a lot of other things that can go into AI, but these are just three uh, fields that um, you can look into later if you are interested. Um, if else statements might sound like, oh, that's not artificial intelligence, that's pretty simple. But that kind of goes back to the point I made earlier that as we expect more from our computers nowadays, uh, some things just don't feel like they're artificial intelligence, but certainly if else statements are a way for computers to be making decisions. And then within artificial intelligence is the field of machine learning. And some things in machine learning are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And in fact, a lot of machine learning practitioners and researchers will tell you that uh, these three fields kind of encompass everything that falls into machine learning. Uh, really quick overview of these three. Supervised learning is when uh, we have data and we also have quote unquote uh, answers to that data. And we want the computer to be able to match uh, certain patterns and data to certain answers. In unsupervised learning, we don't really have the answers and we want the computer to just extract interesting patterns for us. And reinforcement learning is kind of what it sounds like. Um, if you imagine like training a dog, uh, you would you know, maybe give them treats every time they do something well. Uh, that's kind of like what reinforcement is doing. Reinforcement learning is doing. And now uh, 
to get us thinking about the examples we're going to show later tonight, uh, we have an AI pipeline. Um, and this is specifically for image classification, but you can think about how it might broadly apply to the other things we're going to talk about later. So in this, oh, we have a question. How is reinforcement learning different from supervised learning? Okay, that is a great question. So in reinforcement learning, uh, I want to try to avoid getting into too technical of the de details here, so I'll keep it rather high level and kind of by analogy, though I welcome, you know, further questions if it's still confusing for you. In reinforcement learning, you can think of it like uh, you give your machine learning agent, that's typically what we call these things, agents or AI agent, um, like a space to explore, not, well, I guess it can be a physical space, but sorry, right, keep it non-technical. <laughs> You're giving it like a space to explore and every time it takes a good action you give it some sort of reward so maybe what that reward means is it's trying to maximize some number and the higher the number is you know the ai agent says oh i'm doing better because my the number is going up or if it does a bad action uh then it gets a lower number and it says okay i'm not doing that again in the future uh in supervised learning it's different because it's not trying to maximize a reward signal um, per se, what it's doing is we actually, I think supervised learning, I think I can explain that best through this slide here. So let me finish this up and I think that might clarify some things for you. And if it's still confusing, let me know. So I promise I'll circle back to that question, but let me finish this slide up. So this slide here actually, um, as brought up in the chat, this is actually an example of supervised learning and that we're gathering data. So we have, Whole bunch of pictures of cats and dogs and maybe the question here for the ai agent is we want you to you know uh, separate pictures of cats from pictures of dogs and in this case we have the data and we also have the answers um so what that means is each of the images that we collect we have the answer as to you know what is this image so this one is a dog this is a cat this is a cat and so on and then we're going to put that into a machine learning model. Um, I used agent earlier, but you can think of those two as interchangeable. And we're going to train it. Uh, and what that means is we would like the model to capture distinctions or trends in the data. So, you know, this image corresponds to cat, this corresponds to dog, this corresponds to cat. And what we want the machine learning model to do is we want it to figure out, okay, when I see you know, maybe like the eyes are a certain shape or the nose is a certain shape or the ears are a certain shape. I'm talking kind of generally here. Uh, maybe those are some things that it looks at and it will figure out, okay, if I see like kind of pointy ears, maybe that's a cat. Uh, maybe if I see kind of droopy ears or like the animal sticking its tongue out, kind of like that sort of thing, maybe it's a dog. Um, and that's what we're asking a model to do in supervised learning is that Here's the data, here's the answer. We want you to figure out the function that translates uh, this uh, input data to this answer. And then once we think the model is sufficiently trained, we can use it for uh, prediction. So, you know, here we have an image that is not labeled. Oh, I turned off my phone. Here we have an image that is not labeled. Um, obviously you and I look at that and instantly we go, that's a dog. Um, we want the machine learning model to take this image in and hopefully on the other side, it says dog. And um, as I said earlier, this specific example is based on image classification because it's classifying or categorizing images into cat versus dog. And this is supervised learning because we have the answers, all right? So we know that this image is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat and we know exactly what we want the machine learning model to say for each of these uh, training examples. But the framework of gather data, train model, and then predict is generally true for most AI applications. So hopefully this pipeline, like this framework, uh, can be useful for you when looking at some of the other AI tools we'll look at later on in the presentation. Uh, but for the person in the chat, does this kind of clarify things for you between like the difference between reinforcement learning and supervised learning.
Not exactly. Okay. Um, maybe another distinction you could think about is that in reinforcement learning, you may not necessarily have the answer. So one thing that I've been emphasizing a lot is that for supervised learning, you will have the answer in that this image is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat. But in reinforcement learning, maybe we don't know uh, the best course of action for the computer. Uh, and to clarify, for this specific problem of classifying images, you know, maybe we wouldn't use reinforcement learning. Maybe you'd use reinforcement learning in something like a robotics application where uh, you don't have an answer. Like if a robot asks you, how do I walk? You don't have an answer, but you can tell it that is a good action or that is a bad action. And in that way, you're, you're reinforcing positive behavior. Um, so that's maybe another distinction that can help you. Uh, if it's still not clear, uh, you can, oh, okay, perfect, great, <laughs> awesome. So let's move on then. Oh, and what do you know, questions. <laughs> Are there any other questions that people have about the things that I've gone over? I'll give it like, a, I don't know, 10, 10 more seconds or so. Cool, so uh, I did not count 10 seconds, but I assume that was 10 seconds. Um, and I'm not seeing any questions, so I'll move on. But just as a really quick recap, we talked about what is AI, what is ML, and we went over an example of uh, what an AI pipeline might look like for developing an AI tool for a certain application. So now let's talk about today's topics. Uh, yes, <laughs> that was just the preface. That was just the introduction, like the appetizer that we went over. Now is the main portion of the presentation. Um, we're going to be talking about three AI tools or some of them as fields uh, today and some corresponding examples. So we'll be talking about clustering uh, and that will be applied for grouping medical patients. Uh, we'll be talking about natural language processing for generating video titles and time series forecasting for predicting stock price. So let's talk about clustering first. What is clustering? Well, clustering is to partition a data set into clusters. And that might sound confusing because I just used the word in its own definition, but you can think of clusters as like groups where we want similar objects in our data set to go into the same group we want different objects to go into different groups. And this is useful for extracting non-obvious but interesting groups of patterns. And where does this fall into the diagram we showed you earlier? Well, it's sort of AI and sort of ML. Um, and this kind of goes to show you that there aren't really clean distinctions between these things. And, and the diagram was just a visual aid. Um, but since I brought it up, uh, you can think of clustering as data mining, and that data mining, uh, the goal of that field is to find structure and huge amounts of data. Or you could think about it as unsupervised learning or learning about a data set by observation. Um, so again, in contrast to supervised learning, we don't have like answers, but then in contrast to reinforcement learning, it's not like a reward signal that's being maximized. It's just trying to group similar things together. Yeah, sorry, the, these definitions can sometimes be a little vague, but I hope this helps give you a sense of like where on the map a clustering falls. So, you know, maybe this will help is we can talk about some use cases of clustering. Uh, maybe we want to use clustering for market research. So if you think about when you go on Amazon and you purchase something, then it will recommend, hey, maybe you also want to buy this item because uh, people tended to uh, buy these two things together. Well, that's an example of clustering because we're grouping together items that are frequently purchased together and we're not recommending something to you that is like a completely different item. Like if you're buying dog food, we're not gonna recommend the laptop parts. Those are two very different items. So they would go into two different like frequently purchased groups. Or maybe we want to group similar customers. So in the diagram on the right side of the screen, uh, you know, maybe we have some numerical attributes that we're collecting on shoppers at our store. And we want to treat each of these shoppers differently. Like maybe the infrequent shoppers, they need a bit of a push to go shopping and buy more stuff. So we want to figure out who are these infrequent shoppers. And then we can send like, you know, additional savings to them or something to get them incentivized to buy more stuff. 
Or another use case of clustering is fraud detection. Um, I don't have a diagram of this, but let's pretend that the same diagram I have here is for credit card transactions. And we're going to put similar credit card transactions together because maybe those exhibit like normal shopping behavior. And then an outlier, so pretend that my laser pointer is an outlier because it's not in any of those circled groups. You know, they don't belong to any group or cluster, and maybe we should investigate those, right? Maybe there's some weird behavior going on that we think might be indicative of fraud. Another use case is pre-processing, and I know we said that tonight we're going to talk about uh, AI applications for things outside of computer science, but just because I thought this was a kind of neat example, uh, clustering can be used as a tool to prepare data for other algorithms or other AI models. And I have an example of that on the bottom, uh, where the left image has 96,000 colors. And no, I cannot verify that for you. You'll just have to take my word for it that it is 96,000 colors. Uh, and the image on the right is a, a quantized image. And what that means is that similar, similar colors have been clustered together so that 96,000 colors are reduced to 64. And I'm not sure how well it comes through via Zoom screen share. But on my screen, I can see there's a bit of a color gradient in the sky, um, you know, kind of showing that these colors have been reduced. And a reason why that might be useful is because it saves processing time for future models or algorithms. Uh, since they don't have to contend with 96,000 colors, they just have to deal with 64, which evidently, based on my eyes and your eyes, is more than enough to tell what this image is. And then the last use case, which we'll actually see a code example of very shortly, is medical studies. Some issues of clustering is that there you know, are different types of data. So everything I've said so far can be represented as numbers. And that is pretty obvious because you, you can imagine like a ruler between two points on like a graph. You know, the closer they are, the more you want to put them in the same cluster, the further away they are, different clusters, right? But then when it comes to clustering text or images or graphs, uh, maybe that's not as obvious because uh, how do you, you know, measure the similarity of two words or of two different graphs? Like if you represent, for example, a molecule as a graph, maybe. Uh, clustering can also be kind of hard to interpret, especially if data is really high dimensional. Uh, and that means like greater than 3D because in three dimensions, you can kind of visually see what those clusters are, but more than that, and it's going to be difficult. Um, there's also some issues in determining which clustering algorithm to use because a lot of them have kind of base like underlying assumptions. Uh, some assume that clusters are spherical, some assume clusters have the same density, and some need a human expert to set the right parameters. And what that means is that they're kind of like levers you can imagine. They're like levers you can pull on these algorithms, and depending on like what setting you put them at, uh, they can generate different results actually. And there's also an issue of scalability. And that data sets with millions of data points are common. Uh, we're not going to look at that tonight, but you can imagine for a company like Amazon or Facebook, you know, they have millions of users, their data sets are huge. And that can actually even be troubling for computers to handle that much uh, data. Okay, I just went over a lot about what is clustering. Um, before we get into the example, I would like to pause for questions here. Anything that I talked about that was confusing? Are there any use cases of clustering or things that you think clustering might be useful for, you know, that you'd like to share? All of that, you can bring that up. Oh, okay, someone asked, what is an example of high dimensional data? We're actually going to look at that in the example, but uh, to give you a preview, the example data set we're going to look at is uh, medical data. And for each patient, they measured uh, 19 attributes about the patient, like different traits, I guess you could call it. Uh, and that is an example of high dimensional data because you can think of each of these attributes as its own dimension. And I don't know about you, but I cannot see into 19 dimensions. So that is something I cannot visualize the clusters for. But yeah, that's an example of high dimensional data. Does that help? Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, I'll give it a few more seconds to let people ask questions.
watching the breaks, so I'll also break for me to drink water because I've been talking for a while. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, but again, if you do have questions, please, please, please feel free to drop them in the chat and uh, I'll address them as they come up. Oh, right, so before we get into the code, I do want to like provide a bit of meta commentary about what it is we'll be looking at because I think it can be useful to help us understand the code a bit better. So first we're going to talk about Python, which is a very popular programming language, especially for data science and AI machine learning applications. And it's also pretty easy to pick up. There's a list of learning resources that can be found uh, at that link. Um, yes, we just sent a link to a document in the chat that will have, uh, I guess, links to all these things that I'm mentioning in the presentation. So this uh, learning resource for Python should be there as well. And like other programming languages, the thing that's important for us today is that Python has things called libraries. And what libraries are is it's basically code written by other people to make our lives easier. Um, kind of like, uh, you can think of it like a recipe book, right? Like you don't have to learn how to cook, you know, a recipe from scratch every time you've got a recipe book, someone tells you, here's the instructions. Or maybe a more pertinent example is you want to make yourself like a sandwich, you don't have to make the bread yourself, you can just go and buy bread, um, something like that. So some useful libraries for data science are Scikit-Learn, NumPy, and Pandas. Um, and there's a few other libraries that we'll look at uh, later on in the presentation, but these are three that are relevant for clustering that we will be using. And then what is Google Colab? It's a tool for writing and executing Python in your internet browser. And that is fantastic because that means you don't have to set up anything on your own computer and fiddle around with computer settings. You can just run it in like Google Chrome. And what Google Colab lets us do is it creates files called notebooks. These contain your Python code along with any non-code notes you write, you know, which is why they're called notebooks. And we'll see this shortly. Overall, just a really great resource. Uh, you can find a tutorial on it at that link, which again is in the document we sent in the chat. So now back to the presentation. I keep saying we'll get to the lesson example, but I do want to show something really quickly because I think it will be helpful. So we're going to be talking about loading data with pandas and plotting data with matplotlib. Um, those two not students will not be the focus. The focus will be on distance-based versus density-based algorithms. And what does that mean? Well, I think it's best explained visually. So k-means clustering is an example of a distance-based algorithm. And what that means is like if two points are just numerically close to each other, like if you can imagine a ruler between them, this is a two-dimensional example, which is you know perfect for us to visualize because humans cannot see again in higher than 3D. This example here, uh, you and I can kind of eyeball and see that there are three clusters, right? And there's a whole bunch of, I don't know, outlier points here in between, in the space in between. So uh, I told K-means algorithm, I want you to find three clusters and right now it's picked three initial points. And basically I'm just gonna let this animation play and I hope it'll give you an intuitive sense of what's going on with this algorithm. So these are all classified as blue. These are all classified as orange. These are all classified as green. And we can just keep repeating this process and you see that the orange triangle kind of moved to the center of this cluster, sort of. The green one is also sort of at the center and same with the blue. And that's because k-means, uh, it doesn't actually allow for any outliers. Everything belongs to one cluster or another, but it's distance-based, right? Uh, and I think that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Another algorithm we can look at, I, can actually, I can't actually see my tabs. So I'm kind of guessing what tab I'm clicking on. Oh, dbscan, okay. So dbscan is a density-based algorithm. And I think this is also makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, let's pick a smiley face. And what dbscan will do is that it will, uh, like dense, air, dense regions all go into one cluster. Uh, this animation might take a while to play, so I don't think I'll let the whole thing play out, but you can kind of see what's going on, right? It's like, it started with one random point and it said, okay, uh, what are like my neighbors? And it's kind of spreading to all of its neighbors. Uh, maybe, maybe a little too soon, but kind of like a virus. <laughs> it's like spreading to its closest neighbors and connecting all of these things together into, a group. And uh, well, what do you know? I've been, I've been talking long enough that the animation will finish. 
So you can see that uh, all of these, for example, go together and the eyes should also go together into a region. Okay, so it's not perfect. Like, like I said, some of these algorithms require human experts to set parameters. And these are like values that if you tweak them, it can change the algorithm's output. And just as an example, uh, k-means actually cannot handle the smiley face data set. And I'm not saying all data sets look like smiley faces. This is just an example. Uh, so for k-means, let's say I tell it I want four clusters, right? One for the mouth and two, one for each eye and one for the face. Uh, and I was going to keep pressing it. And that's kind of it. <laughs> k-means will not get any better than this because it's distance based. And it's kind of saying, OK, these all kind of close enough to each other. So yeah, that's kind of what we're looking at with that. Now to get into the data set, we're not going to talk about all of the code in super intense detail, but uh, this notebook should be available at the doc. We link in the chat so you can totally read all of my wonderful, wonderful comments on your own time, but really quickly. So this comes from the UCI machine learning repository, and this is a cervical cancer behavior risk data set. Uh, there are 72 patients in this data set, and there are 19 attributes for each patient. So sexual risk behavior, eating behavior, personal hygiene behavior, and so on. Uh, honestly, I don't know <laughs> how they ranked people according to these, but we'll just take their word for it that these are appropriately scored. Uh, and these are all numerical attributes. We're not dealing with any weird data. And then we also know for each patient whether they have cervical cancer or non-cervical cancer. Uh, this unfortunately is not always true of clustering applications. Sometimes you don't know the answers. In this case, we do. And our guiding question is, can these 19 attributes be used to predict whether a patient has cancer? And we want to basically see like, can clustering determine that uh, these behaviors all, when we, when we see these behaviors, we think that this person is gonna have cancer. When we don't see these behaviors, we think they won't have cancer, right? So you can imagine those as two separate groups. Uh, so we're going to use the pandas library to import our data. And pandas also lets us examine the data right here. So here's a preview of the data. This is the first five points and you can see the 19 attributes. And also at the end, you can see that all five of these have a one in the cancer column. So that means that all five of these patients have cervical cancer. You can also look at like a statistical summary, but we're going to skip over that. And let's pretend that we are uh, someone who has never heard of AI before, never heard of clustering, right? You're maybe some doctor and you're interested in finding out, can I group patients to better predict whether or not this patient will have cancer? So you pick two attributes kind of at random and you try to guess, okay, does this look like it's going to cluster well? And unfortunately, it doesn't seem that way, at least not to me. Uh, by the way, in case it's not readable, the blue points are can uh, no cancer and the orange points are uh, has cancer. So then maybe we pick another two points. And in this case, we uh, not points, attributes. In this case, we pick social support appreciation and social support emotionality. And uh, honestly, this seems worse, actually. <laughs> this seems like it's kind of spread out randomly. So let's see if maybe k-means can help us. And what k-means will do is we want it to find two clusters, right? And it tells us that we were able to find two clusters with 77.78% accuracy. And that's not great, maybe, but it's a lot better than what we were doing before of just picking two variables randomly and seeing if they're related to each other. And this suggests that there exists some relationship between the attributes we gathered for each patient and the occurrence of cervical cancer. So maybe this can kind of like guide further research. Like, you know, we want to look into these attributes and see which one of these needs further study. We can also look at dbscan, uh, which is the density algorithm. And unfortunately, dbscan uh, only gives us a 70.83% accuracy, so it's actually worse. And what that means is in this case, we would go with k-means. Um, and there's also some further meta commentary provided at the bottom if you'd like to read more about kind of my thought process when I was making this notebook. And there's actually a paper that this data set came from, which you can also read as well. But yes, this was an introduction to clustering for medical data. And oh yes, as it was clarified in the chat by one of my co-hosts, accuracy means how many patients our algorithm was able to correctly classify. Yes. Uh, as a side note, there are other metrics that machine learning practitioners and researchers use. But for the sake of simplicity for tonight, I just focused on accuracy. OK, are there any questions? 
Oh, is k means a function that finds clusters for you? Yes. Uh, so both of these uh, algorithms I showed tonight, uh, k means and db scan, both of them automatically find uh, clusters, which is the goal of clustering, like as a field of AI. Um, the difference is that for k means, you have to tell it how many clusters there are. And actually, if you go back a couple of slides, um, k means is one of those algorithms that makes an assumption about the data. And its assumption is that it assumes clusters are like spherical uh, because it's distance based. So it kind of assumes that like, uh, like closely related things are all equally far apart from each other. That kind of makes sense. Um, and then DB scan, unlike k means, we do not tell it how many clusters we want. It can actually automatically determine that. Um, but we do have to tell db scan uh, how far apart like points can be, like like how dense of a region uh, we do we consider to be a cluster. So maybe we consider points with five neighbors, that's like a, a dense region, or maybe it's only three neighbors is considered dense. Um, so yeah, different algorithms have different assumptions. They also have different pros and cons, but I didn't really want to dive into the specifics. I would recommend you to read the notebook commentary uh, for more details. Yeah, glad I was able to help. Um, before we go on, the next one is natural language processing. But before we go on, I'd like to ask one more time if there are any questions. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So thank you very much. Uh, and I hope that was an interesting introduction to clustering for you all. And now it's Amin, yeah. Um, just want to make sure you can see my screen, Jason. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. Um, we'll be moving on to natural language processing now, and we have a super fun example lined up for you. Um, so what is natural language processing? It is, it is kind of the subfield of our, both artificial intelligence and linguistics. So it involves studying and analyzing different pieces and different um, corpuses of text. And the goal of natural language processing is um, identifying sentiments, meanings, um, creating your own, uh, training artificial intelligence to create your own sentences, your own um, articles, for example. And there are two main branches of natural language processing. Uh, the first one is natural language generation. That is where you train an AI to create some meaningful and comprehensible um, text. Um, and there's natural language understanding where you train an AI to understand what someone is trying to say through a sentence. So that would, that would involve studying its syntax, the semantics, uh, stuff like that. So um, what are some use cases for natural language generation? For example, you can train an AI to write news articles and blog posts for a news agency. And um, so, so imagine that there's some incident that takes place at maybe 3 a.m at night and instead of waking like um, a writer up, a news agency can just uh, switch on their computer and um, get, that, get their AI to um, write a report on the incident. Um, a use case for natural language understanding is, um, is pretty relevant today is analyzing maybe tweets on Twitter and um, trying to understand the sentiment behind tweets and trying to predict if Bitcoin is going to rise or fall tomorrow. Um, so yeah, so these are some more use cases of natural language processing. Uh, another one is machine translation and machine translation actually requires both understanding. So um, taking in um, sentences, for example, and understanding what they mean and then generating a response or generating the translated version of those sentences. There's also information extraction. So if you have a bunch of documents you, which, you, which you don't have the time to go through, you, would, uh, you could possibly um, run an AI model on it and Get, they get that AI model to extract all the important information. Um, so just like any other um, any other AI uh, method, there are a lot of issues that come with natural language processing. Um, the first issue is sarcasm. Um, so um, this is an example sentence. Um, you lost your you lost our only key. Amazing job. So as humans, we can understand that this is a sarcastic remark, but a computer does not receive information um, about sentences such as like the context, maybe like how the computer know that you lost your key um, or, or maybe the tone. 
that uh, someone says a sentence in. So all the computer receives is this text textual information. So let's see how a computer would see the sentence and maybe analyze the sentence. So it, it's, it, it's reading through the sentence, sees this word lost and lost is usually a negative word. You know, you lose a game uh, of soccer, for example, or you lost your key. So that's a negative word, but then it, it keeps reading and then it reads this um, phrase, this amazing job. Um, and it's like, oh wait, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty positive phrase. So the computer might reach to reach a conclusion that there's like a negative word, but there's also this super positive phrase, then maybe uh, the sentence as a whole is positive. Um, so you can see the issues that uh, sarcasm or maybe things like metaphors or uh, satire can create with natural language processing. Um, there's also um, the issue of multiple me meanings. Um, a simple sentence's meaning changes based on which group of words we emphasize when we're speaking. Uh, so for example, in the first sentence, I didn't say he stole the money. That's, you're, you're saying that you weren't the person who said that, there's someone else who said, claimed that um, someone else stole the money. In the second sentence, I didn't say he stole the money. That is, you're saying that you, you weren't the person to say that and there was someone else who actually claimed. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't say he stole the money. You're refusing, that, you're refusing um, the claim that you said. Um, that someone stole the money. And in the third sentence, it's, I didn't say he stole the money. So um, maybe, you, maybe you said that someone else stole the money and not, not him. So you can, you can kind of make out that even for us, these sentences can be confusing and, and a computer has no idea which words you're emphasizing when you're speaking. So this is another huge problem which, with natural language processing. Um, this third issue is kind of applicable to all machine learning algorithms which take in um, data. Um, so this, there's this really popular phrase in machine learning, um, your model is only as good as your data. And what happens is if your data has certain biases, um, your model is going to train on that data and then it's going to make biased predictions or yeah, it's going to make biased predictions, biased classifications. Um, so there was an NLP model was actually given a whole bunch of documents and it was asked to categorize um, uh, words based on occupations or roles. And um, it was supposed to categorize words closest to the word man and the words, words closest to the word woman. And some words you can see from this um, word cloud, some words closest to man were thug, engineer, or geologist, and some words closest to women were um, receptionist, nurse, and a prostitute. Um, so you can see that natural language processing is just basically an algorithm. It doesn't know that the data is biased, so it's just going to pick up on all the biases in your data, all the stereotypes. Um, there are also um, these are this, these are word clouds of adjectives used to describe a man or a woman. Um, I'm not going to read more of them because it can get pretty um, pretty biased and pretty disrespectful. But you can see that stereotypes and discrimination of the past can get embedded um, through data, and and then when your algorithms are trained on this data, they can create even more um, biased output. And so now I have this final activity. It's like, so I'm going to read this um, article out and it, um, so, so I'm just gonna read this out. Mining company in talks to extract resources from the moon. It's written by someone called Ann Smith. Um, the plan is first miners getting closer to going to the moon. A group from North Carolina would use a state of the art gravity tractor to pull heavy rocks and other materials to the surface to be mined. Okay, so this seems like a pretty normal um, article, it, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really seem abnormal, but guess what? This article is actually written by an AI. So, so this again creates another issue and that is uh, the issue of misuse and misinformation. So just like uh, pretty much any other uh, AI model or machine learning model, uh, it comes with, an NLP comes with a fair share of controversial use cases. Um, you can you can have an AI create a bunch of fake news and spread it over the internet. Um, and that can lead to a lot of problems. So we need to be careful and somehow needs to be re regulated by um, central agencies. And now we should move on to the fun example that we have for you. And um, before we do that, I'll, I'll um, entertain any questions that you have about natural language processing um, or any of the issues we discussed.
if you do have questions, you can drop them in the chat whenever. You don't have to wait for us to um, ask for your questions. Um, but it looks like currently no one has questions. So I'll pass it off to Matt to run you through this um, example of natural language generation. Alrighty, cool. Thanks, Simon. So yeah, we're gonna do a quick example on natural language generation. Um, it's kind of lighthearted. Um, so yeah, I know Aman like touched upon a lot of the issues related to natural language processing, natural language generation, but you know, a lot of those issues are like being addressed currently in research and also just industry in general. Um, so there's gonna be there's a lot of improvement going on there, but also uh, just like as it stands, like NLP, NLG, great technology right now. Um, there's a lot of cool things that we could do with it. And one of the applications that I decided would be cool to share is um, generating fake BuzzFeed titles. So if you've watched YouTube in the past, you know, like 10 years, five years, whatever, um, you may have heard of a channel called BuzzFeed. Um, they're kind of known for their kind of out there crazy videos that are kind of like clickbaity, fun to watch or whatever. Um, here are like example of a few of them if you haven't watched any, but like $3 sushi versus $250 sushi, uh, you know, $1 street food. Um, one of my personal favorites like is when professional dancers try the Fortnite dance challenge. That's a good video. Um, but yeah, they're known for like their click video titles. Um, some of the titles are kind of like crazy or out there. Um, but basically our goal is to use natural language generation to try to generate our own um, BuzzFeed titles. So this collab will kind of run through it. Um, I'll briefly go over it, but if you're interested, um, I'm sure our linked that we sent earlier in chat will have a link to this. Um, so you can take a look at it in your own time. But yeah, so like Jason said earlier, um, when we're talking about an AI pipeline, our first goal was to gather data. So our first goal here is to gather data. And I won't go into the details of it, but um, this code cell right here, if we run it, um, it'll generate or it'll get a list of all the BuzzFeed uh, video titles um, on YouTube. So that includes like their main channel or also like the other channels that they have. So that's our first goal, just to gather the data. And if we take a look at the data, um, there's like 23,000 videos that they have. So there's quite a bit. Um, some of these are kind of crazy. Um, I don't want to like go into a few of them right now, but if you're interested, like go and take a look at your own time. But yeah, all these, this is, yeah, I just printed out like a list of all the videos that they have. Um, and there's quite a bit. So yeah, you can take a look at that in your own time. Then, so like once we get the data, um, our next job is to train the model to recognize um, the trends in the data. So like Evan mentioned, for natural language processing and natural language generation, our goal is to try to like capture like the trends or capture like the, the antics um, that are in like, you know, the text. So like, for example, like for BuzzFeed, a lot of the titles are kind of like funny, you know, some of them are sarcastic, but a lot of them are trying to like garner attention of the audience. So we kind of want to capture that in our natural language generation model. And the way to do that is we want to train our model to kind of recognize those trends. So this is what this code cell is doing right here. Um, this one kind of like runs for a long time because um, when you train an AI model, um, it kind of just takes a while for you know the computer just to like kind of like get those trends or capture those trends. But over time, um, it'll be able to do that. So this is what it's what it's going through right now. And I'm, I'm currently training it right now and it's been running for like 20 minutes. Um, but here are some of the titles that it's like produced so far. So this first one right here was kind of like a new one. Um, this is one it was like at the very beginning of training. So it wasn't too great, um, but so it's like Blank's new crush. Um, and to me, that kind of sounds like a BuzzFeed title um, a little bit if you like add someone's name right here, but it's not like too great, but at least it's gathering like some of the trends. Then this was one from like a little bit like further into training. It was like blank for back to school girls. Um, you know, maybe that's, I'm not sure what BuzzFeed channel that's from, but um, that sounds kind of like a BuzzFeed title. But as you train more or train longer, um, typically like the titles or whatever you're doing, um, the like the language will sound better or sound more like with the actual data that it came from. So as we train longer, I'm sure like we'll get some titles that like sound like more like BuzzFeed titles. So this is kind of like a lighthearted notebook about like natural language processing, natural language generation. And like Amon said, like 
this can be applied to like anything, um, just like writing an article or just anything that has to do with language. Um, this is a great technology. And if you see like uh, in general, like this collab isn't too long. So what's great about it is that um, for this particular collab, um, we imported a library. And if you're out what a library was, um, Jason mentioned that earlier, a library is basically like uh, peop other people write code and basically we could just copy that code so we don't have to like recreate it. So it's like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so we just basically use someone else's model that they created and just like plug and chug our data, and which is great. So it just basically means that we don't have to write as much code. So if you're if you aren't too comfortable with coding, um, this is great to know because then you just have to write a few lines of code or just know how to write a few lines of code, then you can apply natural language processing to whatever field um, you're interested in. And so yeah, like I said, this um, code cell right here, it's currently training. Um, so it's gathering like the trends of the BOSI titles. And down here, this is like the last code block. Um, these are some of the titles that it generated towards the end, like after training. And you'll see some of these kind of sound like BuzzFeed titles. Um, so some of them actually are BuzzFeed titles, which is kind of interesting. Um, I think this one is one of the, like a real BuzzFeed title. And yeah, I, you might be wondering why, like how come it's like copying some of the titles? And so if you remember what I said earlier, there's a total of like 23,000 BuzzFeed titles. And that might sound like a lot, but for a machine learning algorithm, 23,000 like may not be too much, um, especially for uh, like a natural language processing um, model. So for like a model to like perform really well, um, it's better to have like as much data as you can. Um, so in this case, we have like 23,000 like titles, but it would be like better if we had like 100,000 titles. That's what that that way so like the model can like see more variety um, titles. Um, Cause like, if you only have like one title, say like if we like take it to the extremes, say there's only like one title that the model can look at, then it'll probably just copy that title over and over. It won't see like a variety of titles. Whereas like if we have like a hundred thousand titles, um, we'll be able to see like a variety of titles and like try to um, better get like, better like see like the trends, in the titles. So that's probably like, the main point I wanna leave with you today for this collab. Just like the more data that you have, for whatever machine learning model you're doing, um, the better it'll end up being. So yeah, this is this collab. So this is basically NLP, NLG, um, the extent that we'll go to today. But if you have any questions, feel, fee, please feel free to ask them in chat right now uh, before we move on. OK, cool. Seeing none, I'll move on to the next section. So this is our last section today. Uh, it's time series forecasting. I know we're getting close to seven, so I'll, I'll kind of make it quick. But yeah, this is time series forecasting. So what exactly is it? Um, so the goal for time series like forecasting is to use trends in historical data to project uh, future data. So this is useful for like making predictions about fluctuating values, for example, like stock prices or weather. Um, we'll get to that in a sec. And it's a form of supervised learning. And so if you remember what Jason said earlier, supervised learning is a form where we're given data, we're given data and like the answers are labels. And our goal is to try to find the trends or learn the distinctions between the data. And so, yeah, this is what time series analysis is. Um, it's a form of supervised learning. And yeah, like I said, it uses past data to help predict the future. And generally it's a part of a bigger subset of AI slash math called time series analysis. But today we'll just be focusing on one of the more popular algorithms for time series analysis, which is called ARIMA. So this is like a short description on how ARIMA's ex ARIMA works. It's kind of like high level. So we can think of ARIMA as like windows. So we could look at windows of historical data and try to capture the trend that they lead to. So if we're given like this um, history of a stock price, we can look at this first window right here and we can see like, okay, this trend right here, like it could lead to like this um, downward trend. So we kind of like see this trend right here, then we know like, okay, this trend goes like down here. Then we kind of want to look at a window for every single time in the, you know, the history. So we can move the window to right here then see it leads to like right here, this more downward trend, but not so much. Then move the window again, 
and see like this slight upward trend, you know, maybe it'll lead to like this sharp upward trend. So we kind of do that um, until we get to the end. And we kind of, by doing this, we kind of like capture the trend. It's kind of like a cause and effect, if you want to think about it that way, like this like big window will kind of cause this effect right here. So we kind of want to do that over and over just to, you know, get an idea of what the trend is like for the stock, you know, given dis different situations, if the stock is like sharply um, increasing, that'll affect it in a certain way. If it's sharply decreasing, it'll affect it in another way. So by doing this, um, we'll try to, we'll get a like good idea of like how the stock performs. And eventually once we go through all the data and like all the history of the stock, um, we can move the window to the present day and we could use that um, present day to, you know, predict the future. So that's kind of how Arima works at a high level. Um, yeah, so I don't want to get too technical about it, but yeah, that's how it works at a high level. Then of course, for these windows right here, um, if we look at this right here, you know, this might be like a month or whatever. Um, this is like an ar arbitrary value. Um, you could increase the window to like consider more of the past data um, to help predict like this sliver uh, in the future, or you could use less. So you could vary that however you like. Um, of course, if you take it to the extremes, you know, you could consider the entire history of the stock price, you know, just to predict the next day, you know, which might not be the best. Um, and at the same time, you could only use like the previous days, like stock trend to predict the next day, you know, which not might, might not be the best, you know, you have to try to find that balance um, suitable for your needs. Um, so yeah, what are some use cases for like time series? Um, it's good for like studying natural phenomena, like temperature and weather and like rainfall or water flow. And it's also good for like process quality control. You know, it can alert humans like when bad, bad trends are identified. You know, if you're like an operator for like machinery, uh, maybe you could use like an ML model to like look at like the trends on like how the machine is performing. Are there any like issues with the um, machinery? Then if there are bad trends and you can identify that and let, you know, your manager know. Um, another thing is like workload projection. Um, if you have a lot of workload, which is like a lot of comp computing resources being used. Um, you know, it's relevant for like ensuring reliability for cloud services. Um, and yeah, probably like the last one, we're gonna explore this a little bit today uh, for stock market analysis. Um, yeah, we'll see an example of this shortly. Um, but yeah, what are some issues for time series analysis? So the thing is like the data needs to be like as up to date as possible. Like you don't wanna be using like 1950s, you know, stock price to predict like 2021 stock price. So the more up to date your data is, the better the better it will be at predicting like um, the future. And yeah, like I said, you don't want to use like 1951 like rainfall to predict like today's weather. Um, so yeah, that won't be too much of a help. Then also like random events can be a huge issue. You know, like time series analysis, we're just looking like, um, for example, like a stock price. Like we're just looking at the price alone. But if they're like other events like outside of just the stock price. Um, that could really affect, you know, the stock price itself. So like example, like if a company has like a labor strike or like if Elon Musk like tweets, you know, that might like affect the Tesla stock or whatever. Um, so we can't just purely look at the stock price to help, like predict the future stock price. There are other outside effects that, you know, might like hinder like our model's ability to predict. And so, yeah, that's a quick like overview of stock price prediction. Um, with the few minutes we have, I'll really briefly go over this uh, notebook right here. Um, I think I have it open right here. Okay. Yeah, this is a quick notebook on time series analysis. Um, it's kind of short. There's a lot of um, writing here just to like briefly highlight what, what's happening in the code cells and whatnot. But yeah, like I said, um, the same thing with our last collab. The first thing we want to do is we want to gather our data. And if we look at our data, um, we can gather our data with this first code cell. But if we look at our data, this is for Google stock price from 2010 to 2020. Um, you know, this is like the Google stock price. It's kind of cool. Uh, Python allows you to like plot these um, in a cool fashion. You know, you can see the date, the price. Um, so yeah, this is the stock price. Then the next thing we want to do is we want to split the data. So if you can imagine, um, like right here, we want to split the data from like 2010 to like maybe like, you know, the end of 2019. And we kind of want to use that huge chunk to like train our model or like try to capture the trends. Then for like, you know, like the last month or so, we kind of want to take that out and we want to use that last month to like help evaluate how well our model did up predicting. So like 
we'll take that last month out and our model will try to predict what happens in that last month and we'll compare it to what actually happened and uh, making that comparison just like tells us like how well our model did at like predicting this future stock price so that's why we're splitting the data um then like i said yeah the next step is always to train the model or like capture the trends and to do that we'll run the arima algorithm that i briefly talked about so what this is doing is it's basically going through arima capturing the trends but it's also finding like the optimal window size. So I talked about like the varying window sizes, like the small windows or bigger windows. So it's finding like the best window size um, that predicts the future stock price. And we found that the best window size is three, which is um, correlates to like three days. So yeah, this is like training our model. Then here are some like plotting functions. Like I wrote, um, we're just running. This is kind of like a library. You can think about it. Don't worry about it too much. But we could use those functions to like help predict, like plot our model's result. So this is like this is the, what actually happened. Then towards the end, it's kind of small, but the blue line is what actually happened, and the red line, which is kind of straight, is what our model forecasted. And the red area is kind of like the confidence interval. So this is kind of like small. So let's kind of zoom in a little bit, and we could see that you know here the blue line is what actually happened. And the orange line is our forecast. So it's not perfect. It's not like super aligned with what actually happened, but at least it was ap ac like able to like capture the trend, like the slight upward trend, um, which is good. And you know, we, this is like this kind of passes the eyeball test, but you know, we could take it a step further and like add a metric. So one of the metrics that we use is called um, root mean squared error, and to like demonstrate it a little quickly. Um, root, what root mean, root mean squared error does is kind of like, it kind of looks at the like stock price for a given day. And it looks like the stock price for that given day, like the, the predicted value. And it kind of like looks at the distance between the two. So like right here, we see like, you know, there's a distance right here. And so that would be like our error for that particular day. And if we calculate the error for this uh, particular chunk, like this, I think this is like a, like a month span then we just want to add up all these differences between the predicted and what actually happened. So like once we add up all this together, um, that will result in our error. So if we go down here, um, we define, you know, we define that down here. And another thing too is like root mean squared error, it, it squares that difference. Then after it squares that difference, it adds them all together. Then it takes the root, the square root of all that, of the sum. And that's basically our error. And we could take the root mean squared error of our model, which is Arima, and we see that it's um, 30.43. And we could actually compare it to another model called Naive. Um, it's not a model, but basically what Naive is, it's just a random walk. So like on a, any particular day, there's like a 50-50 shot that you know it goes up or down. And we see that right here, that comparing both of them together, that you know Arima and Naive are like pretty close, which um, isn't like too great. So that just goes to show like this time series model, like might not work too well on like the Google stock. And that's kind of like one of the big points I want to make too, is that like when we're going over the issues, like we said that like a time series uh, model, like it might not be perfect because there's other like external factors that might affect the stock other than just, you know, like um, historical trends. So, you know, even like these models might not be perfect. Um, they could be used to like they could you could combine it with like other things like you know Twitter data or other things like that to like form a more accurate model. So if you're more interested in this, um, yeah, again we'll leave a link to this collab um, in the chat. But yeah, I know it's 7:03 right now. We're over three minutes, but this was the last presentation or last Google collab. But yeah, thank you again for attending. Um, we would really appreciate it if you fill out the feedback form. Um, we'll leave it in chat right now. The feedback form. Then also, if you're like more interested in AI or want to get more interested or into like the technical stuff, um, we have a beginner's track workshops that are 7 to 9 p.m. on Tuesdays. Um, but if you don't want to look into like the technical stuff and you want something non-technical, we also have another course um, called like AI ethics course. We partner with ACM Teach LA and that course talks more about like the ethics or like the issues, like some of the stuff we touched upon with like NLP. Um, just like ethical issues. If you're interested in that, we have a course for that. But yeah, we have a lot of resources. Um, then again, 
as you're going through the collapse, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're more than happy to help you. And yeah, thanks again for coming. Um, then yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in chat.